Hi, and thank you everyone for joining us. This is Terry Hewlett. I am the Program Manager for Infection Prevention with the Colorado Hospital Association. I have Jerry Barber with me. He is a registered pharmacist, coordinator for pharmacy and therapeutics and clinical pharmacy services at the University of Colorado. And he sits on the Colorado Hospital Association's Antimicrobial Stewardship Steering Committee. Jerry and I are going to be presenting on Clostridium difficile today, managing Clostridium difficile infection, and an overview of antimicrobial stewardship. Our objectives um, will be at the close of this discussion, attendees should be able to summarize the increasing frequency of Clostridium difficile infection and influence let go oh uh, we, we have to start all over again <laughs> I'm sorry that's okay hi and thanks for joining us this is Terry with the Colorado Hospital Association I am the program manager for infection prevention I have Jerry Barber with me here today he is a registered pharmacist and the coordinator of pharmacy and therapeutics and clinical pharmacy services at the University of Colorado Hospital here in, in Aurora, Colorado. And he also is a member of Colorado Hospital Association's Antimicrobial Stewardship Steering Committee. We're going to talk about um, Clostridium difficile today, managing Clostrid Clostridium difficile infection, and an overview of antimicrobial stewardship. Our objectives will be, at the close of this discussion, attendees should be able to summarize the increasing frequency of Clostridium difficile infection and influence on certain patient populations, to limit, list two elements of a Clostridium difficile infection bundle employed to limit institutional outbreaks, and to describe and identify two antimicrobial stewardship interventions that can positively impact the rate of Clostridium difficile infection. So why I focus on Clostridium difficile? Because in 2013, the CDC declared C. diff an urgent public health threat, placing it first on the list of critical dangers to Americans. Prevention of Clostridium difficile transmission and infection is a top priority safety challenge. Misuse of antibiotics is a primary driver of C. diff, so robust antimicrobial stewardship is a target area for prevention. What this slide shows is that in 2009, there were over 336,000 Clostridium difficile infection-related hospital stays in the U.S., or 9.9% of all hospital stays. Of these, nearly one-third, or 100, just over 110,000, had C. diff as a, primary, as a principal diagnosis, and 226,000 admissions involved CDI as a secondary diagnosis. Hospital stays with C. diff increased fourfold over the first 16-year period. Note that around 2001-2002, this increases threefold, and we'll touch base on that later in the presentation. So deaths related to Clostridium difficile. What this slide shows is that um, deaths due to C. diff increased 400 percent between 2000 and 2007, partly due to a more virulent strain, which Jerry will touch base on later in the presentation. Many reports of, of C. diff focus on adults and seniors in long-term care settings, leading to ignorance of its risk to younger patients. So the clinical and economic burden. What this slide shows is that 25% um, of symptom onset for C. diff occurs in the hospital. 75% of symptom onset occurs outside the acute care hospital, which means long-term care, homes, doctor's offices, Hospital stays due to C. diff tripled over the past decade, and antibiotic exposure and receiving medical care are primary risk factors for C. diff, with 94% of C. diff infections connected to patients getting some level of medical care. And hospitals that follow infection control recommendations can reduce their C. diff rates by 20%. So changes in age-specific C. diff incidence and rate, and this is for 2000 to 2005. So here the age-specific incidence of C. diff infection shows that almost non-existent change of subjects 
ages 18 to 44 and really even 45 to 64. But from 65 onward, especially with our super aged population here, which is in yellow, it's very apparent. Not only incidents, but a 2012 CID paper reporting results of two times phase three multicenter trials conducted in the US, Canada, and Europe comparing the daxomycin to vancomycin found patients 65 and older were twice as likely to have relapse within 28 days compared to patients younger than 65. This was also found among a 60-day examination among patients treated with metronidazole. So again, room for thought. Special populations. Changing epidemiology has led to an increase in community onset and in patients with low or no risk. Beware, be aware of long-term care risk for C. diff due to increased antibiotics exposure for treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria. And this is where antimicrobial stewardship comes into play. If we can treat appropriately and not have unnecessary exposure to antibiotics, we can reduce our C. diff rate, especially in our high-risk populations. And pregnant women are now part of this changing landscape due to their antibiotic exposure for treatment of a UTI, even asymptomatic bacteriuria. That's patient population that it is warranted in. What some of the studies show is that neonates may be colonized with C. diff, and I think that's a piece that people were not aware of. Up to 70% of neonates can be colonized with toxigenic strains, but we, what neonates don't have are the receptors for that toxigenic strain to cause problems to the infant. Um, but neonates, colonized neonates can shed, which means that they can transmit, and I think that's a piece that people need to be aware of. So what this MMWR shows is that, um, and as I said in the last slide, pregnant women are at risk for C. diff. Pregnancy is one of the few times when treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria is appropriate. A UTI can trigger preterm labor, so physicians will not risk an asymptomatic bacteriuria becoming a symptomatic UTI. Um, this leads to increased risk for C. diff in this population due to their exposure. Um, and I won't go into any more of that right now. HRET has developed um, change packages, which really are a tool that can be used to guide practice. Um, this is their 2014 change packet. It's equivalent to a gap analysis, and then it has tools that you can use to drive progress in your facility. The top 10 checklist that is in this change package is equivalent to the gap analysis. It looks at what you're doing, what you're not doing, where you need to make improvements, and then it will have recommendations for what you can do. There are ideas to elicit engagement from key disciplines. The saving lives one room at a time is used to acknowledge EVS staff and the job that they do. Part of the bundle or change package includes environmental services. The EVS checklist is used to, as a reminder of the high touch places in a room that should be cleaned. And then it can be used to evaluate what is being done well and where the opportunities are. And EDS um, staff really are receptive to feedback in terms of where they're doing well and then opportunities for them to improve because they really do want to make that environment the safest it can be for their patients in the hospitals. So what next? We've talked about the changing epidemiology, and we know what populations previously at risk are moving into high-risk categories. We know that treatment of asymptomatic bacteriuria is occurring appropriately in key populations like the pregnant population and inappropriately in our long-term care population for asymptomatic bacteriuria. So what can be done to improve management of Clostridium difficile infection? A prevention bundle is a great start. The bundles may consist of appropriate use of antibiotics, proper testing, and that means knowing what patients should be tested and what patients should not. Why is that patient having diarrhea? No lab test can diagnose Clostridium difficile infection, and we'll discuss this piece a little bit later in the presentation. Timely isolation. So if you truly think that that patient might have C. diff, they, they're symptomatic, their stool has that C. diff smell, then you need to get them in isolation sooner rather than later. Um, and then contact precaution compliance to include appropriate use of hand hygiene product, making sure that staff understand why they need to use soap and water and why the gels and the foams are not appropriate in this situation. 
Appropriate room cleaning and equipment cleaning, and that goes back to the previous slide, making sure that EVS staff understand what product they need to be using to clean that room, and then um, making sure that staff know that you, you need to be using the bleach wipes or a, a bleach product to clean equipment coming out of that room. And then appropriate communication between facilities, and this is important in your patients that are going back and forth between nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities. It really is imperative that as patients are discharged from the acute care facility, if their C. diff has resolved, it's still information that should be shared with the um, receiving facility that this patient has had a, a bout of Clostridium difficile and um, kind of give that nursing home, skilled nursing facility a heads up. And so that leads us into this. This is a form that's available on the um, on the internet. Um, I included this slide as I think it would be a lost opportunity not to touch on the community aspect of managing C. diff, and that goes back to letting um, receiving facilities know. Um, bring in those facilities surrounding the acute care hospitals, such as nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, and long-term acute care. C. diff in the community is a huge issue, which will be talked about later in this presentation. The bottom line is that in order to positively impact rates in the acute care hospitals, community work has to start being a focus. Telogen is actively, Telogen is Colorado's um, quality improvement organization for those who are unfamiliar with Telogen, um, and we work very closely with them, and they provide a lot of education and can hit a lot of, um, of um, facilities out in the community. So as I said, Telogen is actively working in communities. So if you have questions or would like to talk more in depth about community work, you can reach out to Telogen and or to CHA and we can coordinate some further discussions. The takeaway from this, um, from this slide is that communication between facilities is imperative in, in our efforts to decrease transmission. And I share this as only an example of a document that can be used This I'll be really brief on because I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, in 2008, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology published um, this act document that really drives home the need for early, rapid, and accurate identification of C. diff and C. diff diagnosis being essential to the efforts to prevent transmission. This is a bundle that um, APIC put together, and it's pretty easy to follow. Um, I won't go into any more detail, but it's out there and it's available. So effects of a Clostridium difficile bundle. Um, what this slide shows is that with the recognition of a multi-institutional outbreak of C. diff associated diarrhea in June of 2004, major infection control measures, the C. diff bundle, were implemented to curb the spread of C. diff. The incidence of Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea in the study institutions subsequently decreased from 22.5 cases per 1,000 admissions to 12.4 cases per 1,000 admissions. That's cutting it in half. To test or not to test, and, and so earlier in the presentation I said we'd talk about this a little bit later. To test or not to test, treat the patient, not the test. And I think I said earlier that no lab test can diagnose Clostridium difficile infection. Um, if the patient has diarrhea and no other clinical symptom, don't test the patient. There's, there's probably something else going on. Is that patient on tube feeds? Is that patient getting lactulose? Did that patient get a laxative the previous night? Um, testing for C. diff in the absence of clinical symptoms can open the door to potential inappropriate antimicrobial treatment and antibiotic exposure. And I correlate this to the equivalent of treating those asymptomatic bacteriuria patients. If that patient is not having any signs of a UTI, regardless of whether he has smelly urine, you shouldn't be testing that urine. You shouldn't be testing a patient who has diarrhea if they have no other clinical symptoms. Um, I think the only other piece I wanted to kind of go into here was that the, the patients that are positive for C. diff really are sick versus the patient who has multiple diarrhea episodes daily due to tube feeding, lactulose, or, or laxatives. We talked about that. The recommendation is that C. diff testing should not be done on the asymptomatic patient. Diarrhea alone is not indicative of acute illness. Um, and so I will leave it at that and we can go on.
current guidelines, I threw this in just because it is pretty recent. It was the um, strategies to present to prevent Clostridium difficile infections in acute care hospitals. It's by the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America and the Infectious Disease Society of America, a 2014 update. Um, I believe that as we move forward, we really do need to follow evidence-based practice. And I just think it's worth sharing that in this document, it, a, a question that always comes up is should we pay, place patients in isolation if they're asymptomatic because they might be colonized. And this document does not support um, isolating asymptomatic colonized or suspected colonized patients. Emerging diagnostics and C. diff testing. And so for me, when I came across this, it helped me kind of put things in perspective because it, it, it touches on the different types of testing that are out there. And so I share this not as an introduction into discussion of testing accuracy, but more as a reminder of being aware of the testing process in place at your facility and understanding the results you will get from those tests. This has been a learning process in understanding, for me, in understanding the differences between the different testing options available. And to that end, as noted in this study by PCR testing has a high sensitivity and specificity when appropriate testing is done. And for me, the takeaway from all of my work is that PCR picks up the presence of toxigenic producing strain. It does not test for toxin production. Um, one other piece that Jerry and I felt worth sharing is that there are studies that speak to the sensitivity and specificity of the nose. So there's some studies out there that speak about nurse, the nurse's nose being able to um, detect C. diff and the accuracy that goes along with that. And then there's also a study that we reference here um, looking at the ability of a dog to accurately identify C. diff by smell. And as you can see, based on this study, the dog's nose knows. Um, and the dog in the picture is Jerry's dog, actually, Mikey. He was very kind and, and um, let us take a nice picture. And so with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry to take us into the antimicrobial stewardship piece of the discussion and its effects on C. difficile. Thank you, Terry. And so for the afternoon, we'll just do a, a little giggle for a few seconds. And what I'm going to do is read it anyway um, in case... It's uh, showing on the screen is, is not as accurate as I'd like it. During an endoscopy, a versetted patient kept on calling the gastroenterologist, Captain Kirk. After the procedure, the doctor asked why he was being called a Star Trek name. Well, explained the patient, you just went where no man has gone before. And so quickly as we're going to see, and uh, as Terry has already shown you, um, the funny stuff is over. What you see here is another rendition of a slide that you may have seen in many, many different forms um, about the CDC's bacterial threats. And this is from their release of a publication in 2013. And if you notice right at the very top, there is C. diff sitting above even carb carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae and other drug-resistant organisms. So... I think it's very, very important, again, to acknowledge this is obviously an urgent threat. Now, I'm not going to go into, obviously, uh, this busy algorithm, um, but I think what's important for people to recognize here is that this is a disease state where, to date, even with a, a fairly recently released uh, drug just coming to the market, a couple of others on the horizon, potentially a vaccine that is now in late stage um, trials. Look at all the detail here. Look at this. And a lot of this owes to the characteristics of the organism, complicated patient presentation, an ability to survive in spore form and a disease state, that we know has a relapse rate of between 20 and 30 percent. And so the point here is that if you look all the way down at the bottom, we're not going to be going into complicated tapers and the focus treatment, of course, A versus B, you know, some of the nuances. But what we really want to look at is the influence of stewardship on C. diff infection 
and where we can all possibly have some impact. And so this um, slide actually is a, a great definition uh, summed up by Dale Gerding, who actually is a, a renowned C. diff expert out from Minneapolis, VA. And I think what, what you really want to take away about this is that if you look at this top section, um, optimal selection, dose, um, you know, those are things we can easily see and we can easily pull out in a frequency report what the duration of an antimicrobial um, might be. But, you know, the question is, um, what happens when we get to the bottom here, the result, to try and achieve the best clinical outcome for the treatment or prevention of infection with minimal toxicity to the patient, minimal impact on subsequent resistance? And that is where some of the difficulty lies in moving these programs forward. You can't always have instant gratification that's quickly visible. Okay, some of the consequences can be years down the road with impacting the battery of antibiotics you may have on your formulary and showing waning activity. And when that activity begins to decrease, usually the options you're left with are, are quite poor. They tend to be more toxic agents, such as colistin, agents with which you have little solid knowledge of efficacy, prescribers writing for combination therapy that often gives little return on activity, but is certainly known to increase renal or other uh, burden. All of these, incidentally, funnel into higher costs. And so you can appeal to um, people who are helping you with your program, if they're clinically oriented, about the toxicity of the agents, um, about the waning activity and um, combination therapy. If your uh, person overseeing that tends to be more numbers driven, more of an administrative type, then appeal to the higher cost impact. So wide stewardship. What is it about uh, C. diff infection and that disease state that calls for stewardship? And as with other disease states, it's quality. It's now a CMS measure. Safety through everything that we just spoke about, some of those bullet points. And ultimately, again, too, um, what this pours into, cost reduction. Quality usually will take care of itself and tend to reduce costs. But again, immediate because um, stewardship and decreasing antibiotic use obviously shows a decrease in antibiotic expenditures. But if you can minimize C. diff or decrease antibiotic usage, you will often have a parallel in decreased um, expenditures. And in the future, as, as mentioned, uh, keeping up the activity of your antibiogram and the battery of agents you have. Now this slide really uh, just goes to demonstrate that the spectrum of C. diff induced disease and complications. It can range from an asymptomatic colonized carrier, okay, which again uh, Terry went back to. These are people or patients that really should not be treated. In fact, more recent studies have even shown the administration of non-toxigenic C. diff spores may actually help prevent relapse. And so in this case, it's important to know that some non-toxigenic strains of C. diff can actually impart a protective effect to the patient. But we move down to some other uh, items here, which obviously want to catch your attention for the quality of patient care. Pseudomembranous colitis, toxic megacolon, hyperpyrexia, high, high fevers, white counts that mimic, white blood cell counts that mimic a leukemoid reaction, 50,000, 100,000, often a key to a clinician when you have a patient on um, broad spectrum agents and then manifesting these type of high fevers or high white counts, that may be one of the keys to actually go and look for C. diff. And also, as mentioned, um, a 20 to 30% relapse rate, you know, that has 
not really changed over the last 20 to 30 years and in fact may become even more problematic as we look back at the last four to five years. And so again, you see from the business end of an endoscope is a, a normal colon. And here you see considerable C. diff placking and colitis. Here you see the plaques can uh, extend and become so extensive that they can actually retard um, uh, ionic uh, transfer. And so the first order of business really with these patients is to be sure that they are being symptomatically uh, taken care of, given fluid support, checking their electrolytes, which can be impeded with extensive placking such as this. And here this last uh, picture shows you toxic megacolon, which is an emergency. So antibiotics as risk factors for CDI, again, owing to why um, stewardship in the case of C. diff infection. And this is just a very basic um, table put together. And, and we know, and you can see the warnings on all antibiotic agents that are now out by the FDA that um, all antibiotics have an association with C. diff, and that's because they change the GI microflora. Some people look at the spectrum of activity, and, and um, intuitively you would think that a larger and wider spectrum of activity, particularly uh, that of agents covering anaerobes that are in the gut, um, would be big culprits, and they can be. Uh, but there are other pharmacologic characteristics, as we've seen with third-generation cephalosporins, for instance, that are um, uh, eliminated uh, through biliary excretion, um, having high biliary excretion. Those also tend to be implicated uh, quite often. Now, I put together this table. Actually, I brought you this table. It's put together really by John Bartlett, and this table over the last 15 to 20 years has been out. John Bartlett is from Johns Hopkins and also is a, um, a renowned C. diff researcher. And so uh, as he put this together, you can see that even in the rarely categorized column, drugs that are used to treat C. diff, metronidazole and vancomycin, can actually cause it by altering the GI microflora. And again, what we're looking at and we're learning more and more with fecal transplant and the microbiome, as we study the microbiome, the intestinal microbiome, more and more, you know, there needs to be a balance of many of the uh, incumbent flora in the lower colon that you see to the right. I think also importantly, there's a great paper in Clinical Infectious Disease by Robert Owens and Robert Gaines of the Center for Disease Control. And they have a, a beautiful table, I believe it's table four, on antibiotic-associated risk factors for C. diff infection. Um, it'll show you odds ratios for C. diff acquisition for many antibiotics. I think it's also important for clinicians to look at something we've looked at in our institution um, with several medication use evaluations, po proton pump inhibitors have, if not a high association, uh, perhaps even actually a um, causation as demonstrated by Chitness and colleagues. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a pretty well-known, if not a sentinel paper from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2005, an epidemic toxin gene variant strain of, of C. diff this was the same strain responsible for multi-institutional outbreaks outside the U.S., the so-called uh, Quebec or Canadian strain. It was responsible for some 1,400 deaths and an attributable mortality of about 17 um, uh, of about 17 percent. And when we look here at some of the um, findings within some of um, the states here eight healthcare facilities, and again, this uh, Canadian strain, known otherwise as a NAP1 
strain resistant to fluoroquinolones, um, which was shown to be um, highly um, uh, highly uh, statistically significant. And what, what you look at in these latter bullet points, very high white blood cell counts were manifested in these patients, perhaps owing to the prognostic um, outcome of these patients, more severity of disease of NAP1 strains versus non-NAP1. But there were also some confounders as well, where some people with NAP1 did not um, have had, uh, did not have as severe a disease. But certainly, you know, it was shown and, um, you know, as we're seeing over several years, really from the advent of this from 2000 on, particularly from about 2007, is we are seeing increasing morbidity and some really, really severe uh, interventions such as colectomy uh, being required to actually um, take care of patients. And so this epidemic strain, it, it seems to have a TCD C gene deletion, okay, uh, the toxin C diff C uh, gene being deleted. And what we do know is that it, it's highly virulent, as we just spoke, having a 16-fold higher levels of toxin A and on the order of about 23-fold uh, higher levels of toxin B. It may also produce different binary toxins as well that account for increased sporulation, that can maybe uh, account for more severe disease, or as we were speaking also about relapse. And as mentioned, um, a high resistance to quinolones. So the use of these agents, whether it's on institutionalized, hospitalized patients, or even in the community, the frequent use of quinolones, what that does is take down many of those other organisms that we showed in that table uh, two slides prior, and that allows uh, this particular strain to predominate. And so here is uh, the attributable uh, uh, morbidity and mortality due to it, but I think really uh, what we really all want to see is that red box the take home in this study is that 10% of ICU admissions were related to C. diff, okay, and still a colectomy, a C. diff infection related colectomy was still needed in better than 2% of the patients. You know, that is pretty draconian. So, why stewardship? What kind of interventions might work? And this is a meta-analysis of 16 selected studies examining the influence of stewardship programs on C. diff disease and the analyses concluding, as you see here, a decidedly positive effect. So the manuscript does itself, in all fairness, mention a high heterogeneity among the studies, which is not necessarily a good thing among a meta-analysis. Um, but the takeaway is to take a look all through here. All of these strategies um, that come on with these bullets, okay, spectrum, everybody talking about narrowing spectrum, spectrums, education, restriction, prior approval. There basically is something here for the most rudimentary stewardship program, to the most well-endowed uh, well and resourced uh, type of program that um, clinicians on all levels from all fields can influence. And so that, I think, is the take home that working on any one of these or as many of them as you can can certainly have a positive influence. Now, this is another uh, paper. And, you know, if we all accept that antibiotics are a major factor, obviously, then when you're talking about reducing C. diff infection, again, stewardship has to be embraced. And what this is, is a paper from uh, Valaket and other colleagues and showing the reduced total antibiotic consumption 
by 23%, and targeted agents were late-generation cephalosporins, ciprofloxacin, clindamycin, and macrolides. Okay? Um, they did replace ceftriaxone and azith for community-acquired pneumonia with a late-generation quinolone, which I found interesting, but uh, also uh, used gentamicin flagell um, over Cipro and Flagyl for uh, intra-abdominal infection, shortening hospital-acquired pneumonia uh, treatments to eight days for cases other than Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter, where those organisms were isolated. So this is another uh, study showing you the effect of an antibiotic restriction policy on not only C. diff infection, but also multidrug resistant organisms. Uh, what's pointed out here is MRSA and some ESBL producing gram negatives. And it shows you this um, basically moving along a point of education intervention, so the pre phase, and then the post phase beyond the uh, intervention point. And you can see the use of ceftriaxone dropping dramatically. In fact, uh, this institution, a 450-bed district general hospital, so the equivalent of a municipal hospital in the United States, this was a hospital in the UK, uh, really did clamp down on, on ceftriaxone use. And you can see just by the uh, defined daily doses per uh, 1,000 patient days, that they had decreased um, ceftriaxone use from 46.2 defined daily doses to 2.1 defined daily doses per 1,000 patient beds. Reduced Cipro um, as well, 72%, from about 110 defined daily doses to about 30 defined daily doses per 1,000 patient beds. And with that, in that same period, to show you the parallel or the temporal relationship, the rates of C. diff infection were reduced by 77%, from 2.4 cases per 1,000 patient beds to 0 0.55 per 1,000 patient beds. So that is the influence. The next few slides are actually uh, just a case from our hospital at the University of Colorado uh, a few years back, where a cardiothoracic surgeon was interested in using um, ceftriaxone uh, for antimicrobial prophylaxis in open heart cases. And in fact, uh, he was already uh, using it because it was detected by surveillance reports. And I'm going to get to that about not reinventing the wheel and using what is already available. Now, you would think that this would be an open and shut case since his own society, thoracic surgeons, show guidelines prophylaxis for cardiac surgery, and basically I've summed it up with these three bullets that the predominant organism for surgical infections in uh, cardiac surgery are a species of staph, one or another. Um, earlier generations are preferred for prophylaxis. They generally tend to have a little hardier activity against gram positive, and that they also have data that supports that conclusion. Another manner of report. So as I mentioned, we could already see that it was being used because if you look in the middle here, uh, antibiotic selection had fallen off from 100% and had fallen on a few cases under uh, QI examination. And so to, to get to that point is that, you, you know, you may have an antibiotic uh, a stewardship pharmacist or an infectious disease pharmacist solely dedicated to uh, stewardship and antibiotic use rather than being an all-around uh, infectious disease pharmacist. But even for places that do not, institutions that don't, these reports are available from places like infection control or from your QI services, and you can garner them relatively easy. And so over here in the red boxes, we could see that something was going awry. So... I went to contact the surgical fellow about this and went to discuss with him, you know, the importance of not moving out to broader agents 
than what would be needed for good prophylaxis. Um, and immediately was confronted back with what I just said earlier. All antibiotics can cause C. diff, so this is what we want to use to treat this patient. And so while all antibiotics may be associated, there is clearly a much stronger association of the later generation of cephalosporins, as I mentioned, and, and actually the same for later generation quinolones as well. So here is one study that came out from uh, Beth Israel in um, Boston. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here is uh, another one, which is actually still a very classic, simple study showing that patients who are exposed to just a single dose of prophylactic antibiotic who were demonstrated to be negative for C. diff colonization prior to receipt of that one single dose converted demonstrably to at least a carrier state if not actually manifesting C. diff. And so really the sum of all in uh, Privatera's classic paper, second generations were uh, up there quite high. There's a high statistical significance demonstrated. Third generations, even more demonstrable. Um, and as uh, another, paper, uh, another investigator on this paper showed, Dalala, in yet another paper, the third generation cephalosporins even when administered as short-term perioperative prophylaxis, but not even compared to the broad spectrum urethral penicillins, are significantly higher, higher associated with C. diff-related disease. And that I immediately sent back to the fellow. But really, again, a lot of this becomes FaceTime, getting to know, well, what's on this particular surgeon's mind. What is bothering him? Let's go back over the cases. Now, infection control was able to show me there were surgical site infections in three uh, cases over the last 20 months for this surgeon. And as you can see also, you know, these are troubling. Uh, organ space infections in two out of three. You look at the first patient and you see it's a very, very complicated procedure in a, in a young man. But I think what this comes down to is getting to know your antibiogram, getting to know the patterns of activity in your institution. And so what you see here is uh, on, on these patients, now that I pull that away, really there would have been no uh, greater difference between um, the third generation cephalosporin, any more so in activity than cefazolin would have helped in these patients having a methicillin staph uh, aureus on the first case, a Kleb pneumonia and a E. coli, uh, probably from a graft that was taken very near the groin. And then in the third case, uh, also a, a sternal infection, very deep coagulase negative staph. So, you know, we could go on to a fifth, an eighth, a tenth generation cephalosporin that has not even been produced yet, and uh, coverage would be rare, uh, and particularly on enterococci, you know, we just do not have coverage of enterococci with any um, stage cephalosporin. And so affecting change, as, as I mentioned, getting back to really talking with people face-to-face, -face, using key opinion leaders, and implementing uh, instantaneous reminders before uh, they occur or before the proverbial horse gets out of the barn. So really what we look at and we're fearful of is that cardiothoracic surgeon A is beginning to use this when cardiothoracic surgeons B and C say, hey, you know, Surgeon A is pretty happy with this. Maybe we'll use it as well. And so uh, we met with him. We went through those cases, and he was very happy and actually did return back to using uh, cefazolin with good satisfaction. 
Now, um, going forward, I should say really backwards, the antibiogram uh, several years ago when I first arrived at UCH was a simple trifold. And since then, we have turned it from the antibiogram to a stewardship guidebook. And what you see here are just basically a table of contents, and I've circled up some key areas that, you know, anyone can really print. It has to be specific to your institution, but can help guide prescribers, help show them preferred regimens. Uh, in other instances, basically point out no-nos. We have uh, antibiotics and we have pearls, what we call pearls at the end. But we'll just look at these two uh, right here that are circled in red. Renal dosing that also helps ensure safety, ensure that patients don't get more antibiotic than they need so that the concentrations build up, let's say in the case of diminishing renal function, and guidelines. Now, to also help out, you look at these uh, six arrows here, and all of these are associated with med therapy management protocols that can be initiated by pharmacists, and we help move along and, and help the uh, prescribers with that, with the dosing, with optimal dosing, and moving these patients along to receive treatment throughout the course of their stay. And then importantly, um, taking it down, which is, I think, very, very important. We struggled, as you'll see, a little bit with um, duration of therapy. We're spot on with uh, appropriate therapies, but found that therapy was perhaps being carried out longer than was needed. And so on the far right here, you see that we added to this uh, um, a typical uh, duration of therapy for these given disease states. And, you know, this page actually goes all the way down through many um, infection sites and we define the duration to help guide the prescriber. We'd like to put them into antibiotic order sets. We'd like to put on some hard stops, and uh, we'll probably be working to that. And so what we have here is our guidebook, and again, renal dosing via the med therapy management. You see the list of antimicrobials that are listed right there, for example. We also do um, pharmacist-initiated IV to oral uh, switches of agents or de-escalation in certain cases. And many people look at this and say, oh, well, other agents have now, you know, the quinolones have become cheap. You know, what's the big deal? Just keep them on the IV. And it's very important that the education come with this, that there are many agents that have virtually 100% bioavailability. Their tissue levels, their blood levels will be equally as high with the oral dosage form. It's not about saving money with the IV to PO switch, which can be helpful, but what it really is about is patient comfort and satisfaction, increasing their morbi mobility, um, decreasing the likelihood from manipulation of catheter the likelihood of IB-related um, adverse events, such as phlebitis or such as uh, throwing clots, okay? Also, patients who can ambulate um, tend to not manifest with secondary hospital-acquired pneumonias. And it's been shown in a number of papers. And for pharmacists, there are pharmacists... Um, driven papers, but I will tell you two of the larger papers cited down here are in medical journals. They're led by physicians who also conclude that this is a very, very worthwhile tactic and have also shown actually that in many instances, pharmacists perform this conversion much earlier than physicians and in much better fashion without these switches needing to be reversed. And they have shown a decreased length of stay, for instance, at the University of Kentucky. Now, other uh, stewardship activities. I think 
It's important also for us to think outside the box in what we recently instituted uh, with Chris Olson, one of our uh, infection preventionists over at the hospital, Matt Miller, our, one of our ID pharmacists, our pharmacist-initiated contact precautions. You know, if we look at the length of stay, which has become shorter and shorter all around the overall diagnoses, uh, hospital stays have become shorter than they were five years ago or certainly 10 years ago. Often now, it is not unusual to see people, patients who manifest with C. diff, manifesting outside the hospital once they're home or uh, being carried on through in clinics. We were having some instances where the precaution flags that come up on these patients, um, they basically are retired upon discharge of the patient. If a person needs to be readmitted for any reason, but they have not been cleared of their precautions, these people were being missed. However, pharmacists were in an excellent um, vantage point to spot patients because who else would be on an oral vancomycin agent? Sure, it gets a little bit trickier with um, metronidazole, which may have a number of indications, but oral vancomycin, fidaxomycin, you know, those are, are keys that this patient is obviously in the middle of C. diff treatment. And so therefore we can enact some precautions. We also uh, treat a good number of cystic fibrosis patients who are well known to um, not only harbor, but become infected with uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and some very hardy strains. And so frequently after repeated exposure to some of these agents, these patients manifest antibodies to it. They re, uh, manifest in allergic reactions. And so then we're relegated to giving these patients second and third line agents, sometimes again going back to colistin, more toxic agents. And so what we did was standardize antibiotic desensitization and what we found that it improved the safety because these are tedious and they need to be titrated very, very uh, carefully. They need to be administered in a sequential fashion very, very carefully by nurses on the floors. But we did find that by doing this, we were able to have a statistically significant decrease in their ICU bedtime and a decrease in medication errors. So standardized order sets, this is also low-hanging fruit for many institutions. For surgical prophylaxis, it can account for a good amount of uh, antimicrobial use in your institution. So to make this uniform, correct the timing of your pre-op antibiotic doses, get out the appropriate antibiotic agent, and particularly where sometimes people run astray is when there is maybe an allergy or an issue and practitioners need to move to alternatives, uh, it would not be unheard of to know that they move to an alternative agent that is actually just a, a duplicate type of agent and that you'll have, for instance, uh, metronidazole and clindamycin. So you have redundant um, anaerobic coverage, you have positive coverage, but we've missed negative uh, coverage in, uh, let's say, uh, a gynecologic procedure. So appropriate dosing. We've shown in our institution in a couple of studies of uh, favoring weight-based dosings, uh, such as 20 mg per kg of vancomycin. We found it to be um, achieve much higher endothoracic, uh, cardiothoracic tissue in open heart procedures compared to standard dosing of a gram of pre-incision and then following up with a gram. And importantly, uh, intraoperative dosing for lengthy cases is very important and to be mindful about uh, estimated blood loss as, as blood loss is accruing. Basically, your antibiotic is winding up in a vacutainer at the foot of the bed. So you need to replace the agent and then further fluids used to uh, maintain hemodynamic stability of the patient further dilutes the circulating agent. 
and then importantly as well to limit the duration of post-op dosing. And so we've, we've had this instance just recently, and this comes out of Duke where we wanted to emulate the Duke colon bundle. And bundles are important because they're a comprehensive care of the patient from their prep to um, wound management to dressing changes, all of this, and included in that were antibiotics. However, Duke uses ertapenem as their drug of choice, and ertapenem <coughs> certainly has uh, indication for <coughs> colorectal procedures. And it does sound great. Broad spectrum, uh, covers what you need, um, easy for penicillin allergies, and long duration, every 24 hours. But we find that uh, that gives surgeons a very false sense of, of security um, in that, in that, again, if you have those patients who manifest a high amount of blood loss, well, when do you redose those patients? You're thinking that you're covered, but again, that drug is no longer in the patient, but in a vacutainer. So very, very important. So, and then again, redosing. What do you do with this carbapenem, you know, which has been associated with a higher seizure risk? Okay, and also importantly regarding stewardship, how not to come into having to use more colistin because your leading risk factors for carbapenem-resistant enterobacteria ACI are exposure to a carbapenem and a stay in an ICU. So very, very important. So what we did was we standardized cefazolin to weight bait dosing and metronidazole for these colon procedures. Um, the recommendations are now that hardly anyone is to ever receive a one gram dose, which was very, very popular just a year or two ago. Everyone up until about 120 kilos should be receiving a two gram dose of cefazolin or cefoxetin, whatever your agent of choice is. And for patients who are greater than 120 kilos, a three gram dose. Intraoperative dosing should be maintained and Again, we've provided alternatives for severe penicillin allergy. And again, feeling secure with these higher doses then kind of makes the argument easier to limit postoperative dosing. So community-associated C. diff infection. Let me just go through with this. And this is the uh, Chitness paper I spoke about regarding uh, the association of C. diff infection to proton pump inhibitors. And here you see the criteria of a good number of patients and about 350 of them did not receive antibiotics. So to me, this is not an association. This is causation because a full third of them did in fact receive proton pump inhibitors. Very, very important um, to look at these agents and I think that these should also be included in stewardship. And so just quickly to wrap up and show you some of our CHA um, numbers and what we got back in some of the testing, um, we did pretty well uh, regarding rehospitalization. We're sort of in there um, with comparative sites. Um, our rate of 30-day readmission was actually quite good in looking at C. diff infection, which across the board measured out to sites like ours and other like hospitals. Our median length of stay was about the same. Um, again, rehospitalization, about the same. The treatment, I think importantly here, um, that we have managed to really uh, clamp down on our fluoroquinolone use, comparatively speaking anyway. We would still like it to even be less. We use an antibiotic restriction pager, and we also have tiers of restrictions. Uh, so when the pager is not necessarily in use, we engage all our pharmacy, our floor pharmacists, to have a hand in that because stewardship really uh, is everyone's business. Um, Going back down to the oral um, quinolones, we're perhaps a little bit better. 
And surprisingly here, um, what we have found is that we're using uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole in uh, many of these uh, type of UTIs, particularly uh, the more simple ones. Um, we have to be mindful of some of the waning activity of that agent, but as exemplified by our 30-day readmissions, which were quite good, we apparently are cherry-picking just the right people. And so by using uh, this Bactrim compound, you know, we're negating the use of more powerful agents. So in summary, the rising rates and increasing severity of C. diff infection are definitely associated with an increased length of stay, patient morbidity and mortality, um, a significant uh, amount of costs ranging anywhere from like $6,000 to something like $27,000. And we're not even getting into patients needing something like a colectomy or surgical intervention. Okay, these are the factors that have relegated C. diff to urgent threat. And in the last 10 years, as uh, Terry went over, traditional patient profiles such as the elderly uh, and the super aged are exquisitely success susceptible to acquiring C. diff, but still new patient profiles are emerging in these changing healthcare settings, okay? So long-term care facilities, people at home, uh, very, very important. And so we should have this vigilance for new risk factors, such as the uh, aforementioned proton pump in inhibitors, and hypervirulent C. diff strains. Not only NAP1, there are other uh, binary strains that, have, uh, that are out that have been shown to be severe with severe patient presentation and antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic exposure, I think it's fair to say, still remains the strongest influence for inducing C. diff. Prevention is obviously the best medicine. You know, there are some factors that we can um, influence. Obviously, you know, patient age would not be one of them, but narrowing the spectrum of agents, shortening the duration can certainly help. Stewardship programs, as I've shown you at least uh, one slide with one particular program and another with a meta-analysis of another 16 programs, have been shown to decrease the rate of C. diff infection. And clearly, prevention, as mentioned up above in bold, is the best, is the best medicine. So uh, regardless, uh, Terry went over environmental services, personal hygiene for patients themselves, and caretakers, washing your hands. The best way to avoid it and really set this whole sequence in motion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, we hope that you guys were able to gain some, um, a little bit of knowledge and maybe some take-home messages as you work towards antimicrobial stewardship at your facilities. And um, feel free to reach out to either Sarah or myself here at CHA. We can access our experts, including Jerry, with any questions that you may have. Um, and again, thank you for your time. We appreciate your commitment to improving patient safety and quality.